All right. It says I'm live. The uh, the old streaming software says we are live, and so I guess we're good to go here for this week's Panther Letter Show on Wednesday, March 27, 2024. It feels very official and old-timey to say the date as part of the program, but we are live tonight, as we are every week, to talk a little pit sports with you. Football, basketball, recruiting, we talk it all right here on the Panther Lair Show with Jim Hammett from PantherLair.com. We'll welcome him, in, welcome him in shortly as we get through our preliminaries, like we typically do. Uh, like and subscribe, right? Liking and subscribing is the, are the things we always ask you to do. Like this video and subscribe to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash PantherLair.com, where we have all of our pit video content, our daily morning pit videos. And we publish Monday through Friday. We have our weekly live stream that we do right here every Wednesday night at 8 o'clock. We have post-game shows that we do when there are actually games to do post-game shows after. We have uh, interviews and press conferences and highlights and all those kinds of things. You find them all at Panther- or not at pantherlair.com. You find them at youtube.com slash pantherlair.com. Sometimes I mix up the uh, self-penned ad reads, but that's how it goes. The website, pantherlair.com, panther-lair.com, pittsburgh.rivals.com is where you can get all your pit sports coverage, football, basketball, and recruiting. We cover it all at pantherlair.com. And, yeah, give you message words where you can talk to other pit fans about pit sports. Pit fans are hanging out all day, every day, 24 hours a day, literally 24 hours a day, seven days a week at panther-lair.com, pittsburgh.rivals.com. That's where you can uh, talk with other pit fans. We provide the content, and then you go, you read the content or watch the video analysis or whatever we publish on pantalore.com, and you go to the message boards and hang out with other pit fans and talk about it to uh, break things down. And obviously, there's been a lot to talk about lately. Spring camp in full bloom. The NCAA tournament proceeding without pit. We talked about that last week. What it means for the Panthers to miss the NCAA tournament. Now it's all transfer portal time. Who will they get? Who will they lose? Those are pretty much the two big questions. Um, who will they lose to the portal? Who will they lose to the uh, to the NBA? Those are offshoots of that second question. I saw that High Point actually made the CBI, so Zach Austin choosing to go to Pitt, passed on a postseason when his previous school went to the postseason. CB, uh, High Point actually put two players, I think I saw, maybe three on the uh, CBI all-tournament team. They didn't win the CBI. Seattle won the CBI. Um, but Zach Austin could have played in the CBI if he hadn't transferred to Pitt. So this is what you miss out on when you uh, take the opportunity to transfer to a high major school. You miss out on the uh, opportunity to play in, in the postseason. Like Zach Austin could have played for high point in the uh, CBI, but chose not to. But, you know, I wonder if he's regret regretting that decision. I wonder if he's looking at the success or I don't even know uh, how far high point made it in the CBI um, field. I'm going to look that up here real quick. Let you. Oh, they lost in the championship. Oh, my goodness. They got blown out by Seattle, 77-67. High Point was the number one seed in the CBI. They uh, they went 27-9 this season, as a matter of fact. But they got blown out by Seattle. Well, I wouldn't say blown out. They, uh, they played them to a two-point difference in the second half, but they lost by 10. Seattle won 77-67 uh, to win the uh, CBI. That was actually today um, was when that game happened. So... I don't know if you're up to date on your uh, CBI news and and whatnot, but uh, just kind of glancing uh, now. Now I'm interested to see how uh, High Point did. Um, well, they had a guy go for Justin Bodo. Bodo went for 18 and 16, so pretty good game for Justin, but obviously not enough to beat the Seattle Redhawks. High Point Panthers fall to the Seattle Re Redhawks in the 2024 CBI final. So. You know, that's what Zach Austin missed out on the opportunity to do. Let's bring in Jim. Uh, Jim Hammett, our good friend from Panther.com. Get the right screen up here. Jim, were you uh, aware of High Point making the uh, CBI finals? No, no, I, I didn't track that one. I, I was kind of paying attention. I watched a little bit of the NIT last night, but I, I, I didn't dip into the CBI yet, though. Well, well, it's too late now. It's over. They played the championship game today. So... They, they chose a Wednesday afternoon to hold their championship, huh? Wednesday afternoon championship <laughs> game. Yeah, it was like a few hours ago, too. It wasn't I, – I, I don't know where it was played. I would – Ocean Arena. Where's Ocean Arena? Hold on. Let me check. Oh, in Daytona Beach. Woo. I don't know. Destination. I didn't know the CBI had, like I, – I thought the CBI was, like, hosted. You know it what used, I mean? I mean, obviously it used to be, but – yeah, maybe I guess they've changed um 
uh, maybe they've changed their, their system. I, I mean, I'm sure you still have to pay to get in, but um, huh. or well, no, or they just open the door and like, hey, if you want to watch this, by all means. Yeah, people <laughs> just stumble into the uh, stumble in and be like, what's going on in the Ocean Center today? The Ocean Center in Daytona Beach, not to be confused with Deltona, Florida. I always uh, make that mistake. I'm kind of scrolling through some photos of the of the uh, the Ocean Center in Daytona Beach. Anyway, uh, shout out to High Point for winning the CBI. I remember those days. Were you? I mean, what? What do you remember watching the CBI back in like 2012? I remember it was happening. I don't, I don't know if like the championship games were televised. They were on. Um, it was like a channel I didn't get. I don't think it might have been like True TV or something. Or was it was it Versus? Like you no, remember Versus? no, 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 no. It was far more obscure than Versus. <laughs> it might have been like True TV. Um, it was a, it was a channel. I remember it was like only available on like Dish or something. So a bunch of like for the road games, people went to Buffalo Blues and Shady Side because it was like the only place in the city that had whatever package you needed in order to get that channel that broadcast. I. For some reason true comes to mind. It was something. It was something really obscure, like a TBS offshoot or something like that, or this TV or one of those, like my TV or something, like something on like a. I don't know if you have a digital antenna now, but you can get like channel two point four. Yeah. You ever yeah. see those? Like, yeah. which you, you can find some pretty great programming on like two point three and two point four and eleven point three and stuff. You can still happen upon like a late night auction show or something like that. It just the the the. the, the I saw someone say this the other day, and and it's very true. Nothing on YouTube or Instagram live feeds or anything like that people do these days will ever ever match the brilliance of like a late night public access television program. I don't know if you ever watched many of those, but like there were a few around here that were there was a a Saturday night show, a public access show like that showed horror films. I think it was called It's Alive or something. And it was great. And it was like relatively youngish guys. And they had like a metal band and they all dressed up in like ghoul makeup and stuff. And they would be ghouls and then going to commercial break. They'd show like an old like movie, probably something in the public domain. And then they'd go to commercial break and play like their metal band would play going into and out of commercial breaks. It was, it might not even been public access. It might've been like channel 11 or something. It was great though. You don't have any, you don't have any memory of that, right? You guys, you probably didn't get that in Johnstown, did you? I, I don't remember the metal band watching horror movies now. Yeah, it was awesome. It was awesome. <laughs> it sounds, I think it was it called It's cool. Alive. Yeah, there's one out of Chicago too called Sven Gulli. He's pretty great. He's still on. You can find Sven Gulli every like Saturday night. He does sort of a similar thing just without the metal band. But anyway, somehow like 40 people are still watching this despite this. Uh, you know, and and oh, uh, Josh Newark says it was HDNet. Wow. Is that right, Josh? Was it HDNet? I felt like it was even more obscure than HDNet, but I'll take your word for it. I mean, it very well could have been HDNet. So, um, you know, thank you, Josh. I, I'll take your word for that. Uh, yeah. Anyway, 2012, CBI. Good times. Good times. Uh, Jim, I, I want to get into a lot of these comments and questions. People are having uh, a lot of things to talk about. Oh, Josh says he uh, um, looked it up. And Wikipedia doesn't lie. So you're right. I'll, I'll take your word for that. Thank you, Josh, for the research. Josh is in our uh, fact-checking department, I think. Yeah. He's um, he's on the desk. So thanks, Josh. We appreciate you. Um, let's see. I want to get into some of these comments and questions. I want to ask you about Pro Day, but I want to get into some of these uh, topics first here. And, oh, Voodoo IPA confirmed HD net. Look at this. We've got some veteran. If anybody here was at went to Buffalo Blues to watch those games, comment here there was only there were like 10 of us and i mostly remember everybody who was there Backo was there you know brian Backo. Um, yeah, i saw him today. i feel like um our friend jd might have been there if he wasn't there he was still like in the zoo at that time uh i think voodoo ipa attended all the home cbi games i did too but they uh didn't they played a game at like butler's arena maybe that's where they maybe that was where the championship was uh Old or something, but they played at like uh, who did they even play in that? George Washington or somebody like that? Was they it played Washington a, State? It was a Washington State, yeah, maybe they did uh, play George Washington and the, the that was the NIT, yeah, yeah, that's right, that's right, the penultimate year. Were you were you at that one? Probably. You yeah. remember like the George Washington mascot, like just like basically twerking, and it was kind of weird to see because it's like a giant George Washington, like just kind of dancing yeah. along to the stadium music. Yeah, I always thought it was weird when like Robert Morris would roll in with the Colonial because he's got like a George Washington kind of look. You know yeah. what I mean? 
Um, I have I'm, a vague memory of that. The, I just remember that it sucked. That's all I remember about the George Washington suck. game. That's that why I was cool with the NIT <laughs> not being a thing this year. I was like, yeah. that, that wasn't that good of an experience. Don't really need half an effort and half a performance to uh, – to uh, th- this year, don't really need to experience that again. But all right, um, I want to get into some of this stuff. Uh, starting on the football side here, Hog Muncher says, uh, Any insight into what the offense is going to look like from spring practice so far, other than just fast? I mean, I think that's that's the one thing I think everybody sitting in the stands is going to see first is that they go fast. And I think we'll probably even see it at the spring game, right? Uh, like, I don't think they're going to hide that. Uh, I remember the, um, you know, it, Todd Graham's offense was going to go fast like that, and the stat people were all like geared up for the spring game because it was going to be like a test run for them. You know that they could practice. The tempo is going to be the thing that stands out the most. I, I think Jim and you know get your thoughts on this too. Once they get into the actual season, I, I do feel like this is going to be an offense that tries to like chip away, get rhythm going. You know, shorter completions. They keep talking about stretching the field. I imagine for a number of reasons, both on what I think Cade Bell wants to do and what I think they have the receivers to pull off and the quarterbacks to pull off. I think they're going to try and chip away, get into a rhythm, get the tempo going with with quick passes, screens, and quick little hitches and things like that. And I think that's what it's going to look like. I think there's going to be runs involved, but as far as the passing game, I think that's what you're going to see, like a kind of a rhythm passing offense. Is that kind of what you're expecting? Yeah, that's kind of how I envision. And we like I, I cover practice on Friday, and Pat Narduzzi, like before or after practice, he was kind of talking about it. And they were talking to like it's it's going to be twelve to fifteen seconds between a snap. And he was even touting it up. It's like oh, we can get so many more reps in on, on, on practice because we go so fast. So I don't know if that's the case. I mean, well, I guess we'll have to see that play out. But I, I mean, I think you're right. I think it's going to be like. You know those eight eight yard passes, a lot of runs. Like I don't, I don't know how many deep shots they're really going to take, but I mean, I think when the offense is rolling, I think that's when you're going to see the tempo. If they're gaining a couple yards, and it's going to be like back to the line of scrimmage, we're ready to go. And you know, I, I think they talked about like the players are going to look to the sidelines to get the play. There's not going to be someone running on the field. There's not going to be uh, Kenny Pickett running over to Mark Whipple. There's not going to be any of that. It's going to be like, all right, the next play's in, and let's let's get ready to roll. So it'll be interesting to see and. I mean, it, it kind of feels like a transition like that. It, it's going to take more than a year, like to it actually look how it's supposed to look. But I mean, I think we'll get an idea of it. It's interesting too with them going to the the in ear like radio mics this mm-hmm. year. Like that's good, but it almost doesn't help them as much. You know what I mean? I think that helps. That's something a team that huddles we'll be able to use a lot more because you call in the play to the quarterback and the quarterback gives the play to everybody here. Everybody's looking at the sideline and getting their signals anyway. So it'll, it'll be helpful for Cade Bell to have a, a direct line to the quarterback and be able to say a couple of things to him. But first of all, when they're going so fast, there's only so much you're going to be able to tell them because you're not really going to be able to convey that much information in seven to 10 seconds. And second of all, it's not like you're giving him the play and he's relaying it to the rest of the team. Everybody's getting signals anyway. The O-line are going to have their signal guys, the receivers, the running backs, and, and so on. So it's funny, this first year where you can do that and Pitt, at least on offense, isn't going to really like use it that way. I mean, they'll, they'll use it, but it's not going to be like it would have been last year. You know what I mean? Like they're not yeah. going to they're not going to make that much out of it, I don't think. No, I wouldn't think so. And I mean, it, it's just a matter of like they're they're playing the tempo. Like I, I think Narduzzi compared it to like when whenever he played Tennessee, like whenever you have to be ready to go, and it's like okay, the play's over, sprint to your spot. Like as a defensive player, and like that's what that's what the offense wants you to do. They want you to be chaotic. They want you to you know be second guessing yourself, and uh, you know obviously sucking wind. I mean, that's you know how many times when Pitt played Tennessee was. Devin Danielson or David Green on the ground trying to like slow things down, but like that's what Pitt wants to do to other teams, and I, I you know, it, it'll be interesting to see. And I, I, I mean, I think we'll see some of it in the spring game, but yeah, I mean, it's that's how it's supposed to be. I, at least that's what they're saying. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm also curious to see like, um, do do they keep their nerve? You know what I mean? If they have a couple series in a row where they go three and out and only take like. 14 seconds off the clock because it's three incomplete passes. <laughs> well, I guess it, it wouldn't be that, but like um, say they go three and out, but they, they gain like eight yards on three screen passes. You know what I mean? And and they punt having taken like 
12 seconds or 13 seconds off the clock. Like if that happens a couple of drives in a row, do they lose their nerve? I actually don't think Cade Bell is going to lose his nerve. I think he's really confident. I think he really believes in what he does. I think he really believes that it can work. And I think he really, I, I think he's got a whole lot of confidence that he's going to be able to pull this off. And I don't think Pat Narduzzi will meddle to the point that he'd be like, all right, that's enough. Slow it down. But I got to think it's going to be tempting at certain points. You know what I mean? Of like, dude, you can't put our defense back out there. You've got to slow down. Is he going to be able to fight that temptation if they, you know, move in sort of fits and starts and, and struggle a little bit? Is he going to be able to fight that temptation? Yeah, I mean, because you look at this past season, it, it came down to just – you know, as simple as losing the time of possession battle. I mean, Pitt was three and out a lot. And like a lot of the reason the defense faltered a good bit is they were just on the field all the time. So, uh, I, I mean, I guess you've run the risk of that happening again, but I mean, you also have to have belief in what you're doing and what you change is going to work. So, I mean, yeah, I, I'm interested to see like the, like the first two possessions, if they do go three and out, what happens? Because, you know, he's a defensive guy and he doesn't like his defense on the field that much. So it'll I don't know. I don't know how yeah. it's all going to work. I, I mean, I think that's kind of been the motto of the offseason. We'll see. Yeah, we'll see. I, I just remember uh, complaints, uh, you know, hearing stories about complaints during that Syracuse game in 2016 of, like, guys being like, will you stop scoring? Can you please just stop having these one-play drives? Can you just slow down a little bit so that our defense can – and, I mean, like, it wasn't Matt Canada's fault that Syracuse didn't tackle in that game. You know, yeah. like, like it wasn't his fault that that kept happening. Uh, but I think there were some sore feelings and it might've been from, um, Josh Conklin, but I'm, I don't see Josh Conklin as the type to yell at Matt Canada. No, Pat Narduzzi, on the other hand, I could see some, some conflicts there. And I think that was the last game. That was the season finale, right? So that was the last game that, uh, Canada coached, I believe. Am I right about that? Uh, it, I kind of forget because it, it was after the Clemson game. So it was, I, I know they ended with. Duke and Syracuse. I just don't remember which order it was in. Oh, yeah. Duke was definitely the week after um, Clemson. I know, I know that for a fact because I remember thinking like, oh, man, this crowd. And then the crowd ended up being like 41,000 or something for the Duke game. I'm like, how, how are people not showing up for this game? They just went and upset the number two team in the country. Like, are you really not showing up? It was a little cold that day. And I just remember thinking like, if they can't get a decent crowd right now on the heels of what happened last week, I, I don't know what's going to draw fans. You know what I mean? I don't know what's going to get people out to the to the game if that wasn't enough. I, I remember there was a game in 2013. They went down to Duke and won like 58-55. Um, Tyler Boyd went crazy. Tom Savage threw for like 400 yards. They had like four or six interceptions. Like Pitt's defense had like four interceptions and they still gave up like 50-some points to Duke. It was crazy. And they came home, and I feel like they were like 3-0 and at that point. And they were coming home to, to face Virginia. Um, and it was like a beautiful day. It was gorgeous. I was like, okay, if ever there was a day for people to show up, it's going to be this. The offense just lit it up. People love offense. They like high scoring. They just had this high scoring game. It's a beautiful day. It might have been homecoming real early in the season, all this stuff. And it was still, it was like 38,000. And I was like, what do you people want? Like, what like, What more could you ask for? Tickets were dirt cheap. The team's scoring a ton of points. They're winning some games. And it's a beautiful day. It is a perfect day to come to this stadium. And they still couldn't. There, there's been so many times when I'm like, okay, this is the day where a crowd's going to show up. And the crowd never shows up. Uh, TRR says, low, bub, and maybe Malik Thomas. Pitt's version of lethal weapon three. Chances all three are on the roster next season. I, I mean, I'm going to play the odds and say the chances of all three of those guys being on Pitt's roster next season are low. There's a lot that has to happen. I mean, Joe and Low feels like the easiest one out of all that. They just got to get an NIL deal marked out. Bub, bub Carrington, they've got to figure out. He's got to figure out if he's going to go to the NF, uh, NFL, the NBA or not. And then Malik Thomas hasn't even reclassified yet, right? I know there's yeah. a lot of talk about him possibly doing it, but as of the last check, he's still in the 2025 recruiting class. So, like, and then you know you, you need to re reclassify, and you need to beat Kentucky for his recruitment, which I, I know there's a, it seems like a groundswell of uh, you know momentum in Pitt's favor. But I mean, there's a lot that has to happen for Pitt to get those three guys all on the roster next season. So I I would say the odds are 
pretty low. What do you think? I would think low, and I would also think like Malik and Bub probably wouldn't cross over. Like it, it would be like maybe Malik goes to pit after Bub declares he's in the NBA because I think they they kind of like do the same thing and they kind of have the same role. So I don't know how they would coexist. But again, yeah, Malik Thomas still has to reclassify and like. As of like, I think last week were the state championships, and his coach was saying like, "Yeah, we have this like really great schedule next year, and like Malik's going to be on our team." And it's like, "Oh, okay." So I, I don't know. I mean, I don't think he made any decisions yet. I, I he he may know, he may have an idea, but I, I I don't think there's been any anything concrete saying Malik Thomas is skipping his senior year of high school. Yeah. So there's a lot that would have to happen. Um, you know, and Austin Libro asked the same question. What do you think the chances are Malik reclassifying and coming to Pitt? I mean, right now, low. I, I think Pitt has a decent shot. I just don't know if they have a decent shot of landing him for this fall. You know what I mean? Like, I, I yeah. you know, I, like taking the reclassifying question out of it, how do you feel about Pitt's chances? I, I, I'd say they're pretty good. I mean, as good as they can be whenever – you know, the competitions, Kentucky, Indiana, Kansas, you you know, whoever. So, I mean, I think Pitt's done a really good job. I think the Cables have a good relationship with them. And obviously the Cummings factor, uh, being close to home. I mean, like they've done everything right. And I mean, obviously in this day and age, recruitment's kind of come down to NIL and can pick it close to what the other schools are offering. So I, I think Pitt has put itself in as good of a position as it can. I, I just don't know where that really leaves them in terms of a percentage yeah and and if he doesn't reclassify if he stays in the 25 class then there's like you know there's a lot of time left you know what i mean there's a lot of different there, yeah. there's a lot of time for this thing to take different twists and turns uh wolf hd says any truth to eli holstein seemingly already being top two on the depth chart for quarterback um well i believe there's truth to it since i wrote it <laughs> I, I wrote it on uh, whatever day it was Tuesday that that I think it's you know he he's I, I think I wrote I wrote last week that I believed you know he had moved up to number three and I think you know based on what we've seen out of some practices and what we've heard out of some things I, I think he's working right behind Nate Yarnell and potentially pushing Yarnell I don't, I don't think he's jumping into the starting job just yet but I do think he's worked himself up in the top two so yeah Wolf I would say I I do think there's some truth to it uh, you know I. I hope that's a question that was based on reading it from reading what I wrote. But um, as far as Eli Holstein, the transfer from Alabama, I mean, I think I look at the guys around him, right? I mean, I think Nate Yarnell has still kept himself at the top of the depth chart. But when you move on from there, Jim, like Christian Bayer, I just don't know. And, and, and I mean, anything can happen. Anything can change. I think it's going to take a lot for him to sort of get the trust back, so to speak. I, I think – you know, everything, you know, we heard last spring and last summer that he was turnover prone and he was, he made mistakes. Obviously that showed up during the season when he had like, what, like six interceptions and two fumbles in his final three starts. You know, I mean, it was pretty disastrous performance and very turnover prone. And it sounds like that hasn't changed this spring that he's still making those mistakes. Uh, and then you move beyond that. It's, it's Ty Diefenbach, who I think is still pretty raw and, um, you know, even though he's the same class uh, designation as as Holstein, and then there's Julian Duggar, who's who's a true freshman, and so it's it's not crazy to me that Holstein has moved up the depth chart. The question is whether he'll end up passing uh, Nate Yarnell. I think he'll get an opportunity to do so. I think they'll they'll make a real competition out of it. Um, I I just don't know if that's going to happen or not, but it would not shock me in the least if we go into next season and it's Yarnell listed number one and Holstein listed number two. Would it shock you? No, not at all. I mean, I, I think going, I think at the start of camp, I, I, we would probably say it was Yarnell, Bayer, then the other three were kind of all on equal footing. I think so far he's already passed the other two, which isn't a surprise. It's kind of what we expected. And I mean, I think right now it's like the backup battle is between Bayer and Holstein and with Holstein probably slightly ahead right now. Um, I, I know when you wrote that, everyone like on the message board like quickly was like, oh, he's like as good as Yarnell. Like, let's just start him. I don't I don't think that's what the case is. Like, and I yeah. that's not what you wrote either. Like, I don't think you ever made it like anything like, no, Yarnell's still the, the starter from everything we've heard and seen. And so yeah. I, I don't know, but I mean I, I think Holstein's gonna make a push. And I mean, I don't think they're gonna announce a starting quarterback this spring. Like last year, like we kind of knew it was like Jerkovic, like by 
this time almost. I think yeah. they kind of let it out. And I don't know if they're going to do that just yet, but I mean, it, it's still Yarnell right now, but I mean, Holstein's definitely going to make a push. Yeah. I, um, the, the other thing in that thread on the message board, some people were like, you know, if it's close or whatever, I, I say you just go with Holstein and take your lumps this year. I, I don't think you take your lumps the year after you go three and nine. No. You know, like this, this is not the time to take your lumps. You need to find your best option, the guy who gives you the best chance to win. And you need to roll with him because you you took your lumps last year and you should have taken your lumps all season with Nate Yarnell last year. And it would have been okay to do so. You're coming off, you know, 20 wins over the course of the previous two seasons. You could take your lumps with Nate Yarnell. You'd be all right. And you probably would win six or seven or eight games doing so. But you didn't do that. You wasted away like, 10 games or nine games and you ended up in the situation where you were three and nine. Now you can't take your lumps. You have to have your best uh, guys out there. Now Wolf HD follows up and says, um, if it's true that Holstein moved up, uh, I think Bayer transfers again is what Wolf HD says. He can, right? So they, they, they remove the rule about two-time transfers or whatever. Bayer wants to transfer. Look, there's five scholarship quarterbacks right now. I don't think they'll have five scholarship quarterbacks in August. I, I think somebody from this group is going to leave, um, whoever it may be. You know, I, I think somebody from that group is is going to leave. I, I think the question, Jim, is do you think – and we don't have to really name names, but I mean, do you think one guy is going to leave or do you think more than one will leave? I mean, if if any quarterbacks leave, I, I would probably have it less than two. I mean, I, I could see one guy moving on. I, I can't see everyone moving on because – it's like a guy like Duggar, like he's a freshman, like how he's not expecting to play this year, no matter the, any of the circumstances. So I, I, I don't know about Bayer. I mean, I, I saw Christian Bayer today. He was uh, the quarterback at the Pitts Pro, Pro Day. Today. Oh, did he throw? I, I was going to ask you about that. Is he, he was, he threw for Bub Means? He did. And Phil Dracovic? Yeah. You know, we were talking about that at practice yesterday. Uh, I was talking to some of the other writers. We were trying to guess of like who would throw for Bub Means. Like, it wouldn't be Phil since Phil was running routes. Um, what do you have, Yarnell? What do you have, Vare? And and I, the thing I felt was like, you know, Vare would make a lot of sense because when it's just him throwing to a receiver, like he throws a really, really pretty ball. You know what I mean? He throws he he throws the ball really well. He has He's the got best a big arm. arm. Yeah, it looks great coming out of his arm. But the problem is, is when you put the darn defenders on the field. And then they want to get the ball, and like that, that's it. Just gets tricky. Then the ball ends up going to them, and you don't want it to go to them, but it does. But if you take those, you know, so and sos out of the mix, and it's just you and a receiver, that's a pretty great setup. If I was Bub Means, I would probably pick Christian Bayer as well. Um, how did how do you look? I mean, did he did he make nice throws to Means and uh, Dracovic? Yeah, he was making some good throws, and, you know, I thought Bob looked great. I mean, they started doing interviews, like, while that was going on, so I didn't get, like, a close look of it. I, I don't know what happened. I, I did post the video, but I think during A.J. Woods, uh, his interview, uh, there was a pass that kind of, like, sailed, and it went into the corner of the end zone, and they had, like, roped off, and Malcolm Epps just went flying over this rope. like it. So I don't know if it was, like, Christian kind of led him a little too far, but, like, uh, there's, like, a little bit of a commotion if you watch the video, and that was Malcolm <laughs> Epps tripping over uh, a, a rope on a throw from uh, Christian Bayer. That's right. Malcolm Epps, uh, he worked out, too. So was it Epps, Means, and Jerkovic as far as, like, offensive, like, skill guys, like and, receivers, tight ends? And Sebo. Sebo. Oh, and Sebo, right, and running back. Okay, so those four guys. It's not a bad group, I guess. How did did you happen to uh, make? I I apologize if you if you wrote this. I, I didn't get a chance to follow along with the thread. But uh, how did Sibo? Did you get a sense of how he tested today? I, I thought pretty well. Like in terms of like I, I was looking at his like forty and his his bench and like it wasn't that far off from like you know some of the best performers at the combine. So mm -hmm. I forget the one. I wrote something. I think Shane Simon's bench press would have been tops of any linebacker at the combine, which was really? impressive. Yeah, I was impressed by that. I, I wondered about him. We were talking about like sort of under the radar draft guys the other day, and I, I wondered about Shane Simon. I wondered if he would be if he was like fast enough, if he was athletic enough. You know, do, what, like how did he look going through those parts of the uh, the drills? I thought he looked pretty good. Um, I, I, I 
I, I don't I don't know exactly what I'm looking for as a, you know as opposed to the NFL scout standing next to me, but I, I thought he was moving pretty well, and I thought he had a good day overall. I thought his vertical looked pretty good. I don't have like the exact numbers in front of me, and like the whole combo or the whole pro day thing's weird because like everyone keeps their own notes and their own forty times, so you have to like kind of like look yeah, over right. shoulders, and so like you you don't get like we're there for like hours, and like you only get like certain numbers that are actually real. You can actually count the bench presses yourself and that kind of thing. Yeah, but like when it comes to forty time, everyone's like kind of holding their stopwatch close. So like I think Jerry DePaula and I were like standing next to like a Raven Scout, just kind of looking over the uh, shoulder. <laughs> you didn't bring your own stopwatch? I didn't. That's it's, it's something I always forget until like the day of. I'm like, oh crap, I have to like do all this. <laughs> I, uh, I I think the one year I, I covered it a few years ago, I uh, got my phone out did the stopwatch on my phone but it, it's a little bit tougher like a stopwatch you know where the buttons are you know what i mean like you don't have to look at the buttons you just nah, yeah, you click it and you're that. watching and you hit the other button uh your phone you have to really kind of know where that stop button is and that can get i can get a little bit tricky but anybody like surprise you with how they looked or how they tested or just any anything uh from from pro day today that, that really was a surprise i mean just talking uh i think jay cradle was the first one to point it out that Matt Gonsalves has only been working out for three weeks because of his, because of the toe injury and everything. Right. He didn't do everything at the combine. So like, you know, in three weeks, he, he was moving around pretty good. I mean, he had 19 on the bench press, which was probably low for him, I would say. Yeah. But for the most part, he looked pretty good. And I think towards the end, even Narduzzi said, he's like, yeah, he's probably limping a little bit, but like he, he did well. Uh, you know, AJ Woods, his second 40 time. I mean, that's again, it's not unofficial, but it was like four three. I mean, like he was yeah. moving, and I, I don't think that's a surprise. I think he's kind of held that distinction as fastest guy on the team since he's been here, and he kind of held up on it today. Yeah, he was really, I mean, he was a big track guy, you know what I mean, coming out of high school. And so I figured he, you know, I figured he would have good straight line speed, figured MJ Devonshire would have good straight line speed. Um, I don't know. I, I I don't have a great feel for what this draft is going to do for Pitt. You know, I I I, I think you know, it seems like Bub Means will get drafted. I I would imagine Mac and Salves gets drafted more than one of the corners. You think? Yeah, I would. I would. I would. The three guys that got invited to the combine, I I think, are the most likely. But I, I think AJ Woods did some good things today. And like I just kind of it kind of dawned on me because he was there. Uh, Jason Pinnock, like he did not get invited to the combine, but like he crushed it at Pitts Pro Day a couple years ago and got drafted. And I, I kind of asked AJ, I was like, "Is that something you think about?" And he he kind of did say like, "Yeah, like I know it's possible to get drafted and not go to the combine." And I thought yeah. he he did really well today. So I mean, if you're a cornerback playing in this defense, which I think NFL teams value, and you run a, you're running something below a four four, I mean, I think he has a chance as well. Yeah, Pinnock's tape was better though. You know, like I, I can't imagine AJ Woods' tape is all that good. You know what I mean? Like, like I, I think Jason was really good at Pitt. I think Woods was just okay. Well, they, they both kind of had the same thing because they were like the third cornerback. Because whenever Pinnock played, they had Dane Jackson and Damari Mathis. Like he was never like the well, star. Math, but Mathis got hurt the one year. Mathis that, got that hurt in 2020, I think it was. Because Mathis and Pinnock never actually started opposite of each other. Because right. it was supposed to be their final year. It was going to be, or, well, yeah, I don't think they actually started next to each other because, like, Mathis got hurt in the priest's effort. I think it was 2020. It was. Yeah. And then Pinnock played, but then Pinnock left because I don't think they were both on the ACC championship team, were they? No, Pin they Pinnock. Were. No, Pinnock wasn't on the team. No? Okay, so then Mathis started that year. Um, so, you know, so yes, yes and no, but I mean, I think Pinnock was pretty good that year when he started, and, you know, he, he had good size. It, it felt like it was just sort of he needed to go over the top with um, with the testing stuff, which, which he did, whereas I think Woods, I don't know if Woods has the tape that, that Pinnock had. I wonder about MJ Devonshire. I mean, to be honest, I, I, I don't know if his tape from this past season was all that good. So he's got the great measurables. He's got the big plays. But, you know, I, I think there, there's a pretty somewhat strong consensus uh, that he didn't have his best season this past year. So I wonder if that hurts him. I wonder if 
you know, Marquez, obviously the, the problems with the size, you know, and, and that it's not that you can't succeed as a smaller corner. And again, he's proven it in this defense. I think he probably has the best film of any of those guys. Um, he just doesn't have the measurables that they have. Um, but I, I don't think he's going to get drafted because he's so small. Right. So I don't know. What did you say? What was your answer? Do you think more than one of those three gets drafted? Um, I, I think Devin Shire, I'm a little higher on him. I, I just think from what just kind of the vibes around him, it was like he didn't run the 40 today. He didn't do the like he stood on whatever yeah. he did at the combine. So, right. Which I, which I understand. He, 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 yeah. he if you do that well, you're not going to risk doing worse no. but uh, he he said he had like visits set up with the bills and the Steelers, and or, like it's kind of further along for him so it kind of feels like he's more on the radar of being drafted um so yeah i, I would say means devonshire can solve this if he never got hurt it wouldn't have even been a question right then I, woods is my fourth like as a maybe mm -hmm. yeah it's not uh not a not not a particularly strong group, but I mean, you know, it's a group that's coming off a three and nine season. You know, <laughs> like they they were part of that team, and uh, you know, maybe if uh, you you would think if there was uh, a stronger group of NFL draft candidates coming out, the team itself probably would have had more success. You know, I mean, you look at twenty twenty one, you look at twenty twenty two, they had more NFL guys. Um, I haven't really looked ahead. Do you do you have any early thoughts on on next year? I'm going to have to bring up the scholarship board of like what, what Pitt's class coming out is going to look like next year. I don't I, I, I mean, Gavin, maybe. Yeah. Like if he has more than 23 catches in a season, that would probably help his cause. Right. Um, would Branson Taylor get an, a, a combine invite? I would think so. I mean, if you're a three, three year starting left tackle at a power five, you're, you're going to get that long look. Um, right. Day on Hayes. I would think Shields, they, Solomon yeah. will get an invite. I would think. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of it might be predicated on what happens this year. But um, like, like if Dayon has a good year, then I, I mean, I think it'll be obvious. But like right now, we're you know we need to see him do it for twelve games. But yeah, yeah. I yeah, guess like, I mean, kind of looking down the list here. I mean, like you know, you got Bartholomew Taylor, Dayon. We'll see what he does. De Shields, um, Donovan McMillan. Potentially he could come out, you know, he'll be a senior. PJ O'Brien will be a senior. Ben Sauls will be a, a red shirt senior. Um, you know, I mean, like there might be three, four, maybe five draft picks, depending on how they play this year. I mean, that, that looks like a pretty good crop, actually. I mean, bet, it looks better than this year, I would say. I would agree. I mean, I, I kind of forgot about like Donovan McMillan might be their best player just on the team and probably best draft prospect. I mean, I, I think he'll probably translate to the league as well, just especially with how, you know, the NFL views pits defensive backs. I mean, there's at least yeah. one drafted every year. I, uh, I don't know. Um, I, I don't have a great feel for his speed, but the size and the physicality, the tackling, I mean, that's, that's all there in spades. You know what I mean? And I think he's, oh, yeah. wh whatever his speed is, it's fast enough to play that kind of a, a, a down safety, a strong safety in the NFL, I would think. So, yeah, that's a pretty good, pretty good group. And that's just like guys who are seniors. That doesn't, you know, count. I don't know who would come out from the younger group. Um, I'm just kind of glancing over it real quick of who would be in that next class. No real obvious options of guys who, I mean, Javon McIntyre could have a huge year this year and, and come out early, I guess. But otherwise, I don't really know if anybody jumps off the page there but who knows guys will always uh show up and surprise i suppose let's get uh back into some comments and questions here uh austin libro wants to know have you seen much of the western carolina transfers if so how do they look not big <laughs> Small. Like, like i mean like I, I i hate to reduce it to that and i hate to to overstate that and i hate to keep coming back to it people on the boards we're reading like the spring camp reports are probably tired of hearing it. Like we get it. We know they're small, but I, like when you see them in person, you're like, dang, that dude's short. You know, like, yeah. like Desmond Reed is really small and that it doesn't mean small guys can't make plays. Like it doesn't mean small guys, you know, height is not the, the be all end all, but I mean, it's tough. Like, can you hold up in the ACC? Like when when you're when you're that size, I mean, I think Reed is smaller. When we talk about Marquez Williams, he's smaller than Marquez Williams, and that's that's concerning. I think they're fast. 
You know what I mean? They certainly know the offense, which is a huge boost, and, and, and I think a benefit to the guys around them as well. Uh, but they're just not big. And and until I see them in a game, play a full game, and and kind of, you know, hold up to all of that, like, I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't have a lot else to go on. I don't know. What do you think of those guys? Yeah, I mean, I think the thing with Reed is, like, I, I think he's just – in a competition right now. I mean, I think there's a lot of different running backs that could probably see, you know, see the field with, you know, Hammond being the main one. I mean, he's probably going to be your number one back. So, uh, I mean, I think with the receivers, I, I, I wrote about this, I think a couple weeks ago, and I still believe it to be true that the three returning guys are probably going to be the three starter receivers and probably get most of the snaps. But I mean, I think there's a space for guys like, you know, CJ Lee and, uh, Poppy Williams, I, I, I think we're going with that instead of Raphael. So. I'm not. I'm still. I'm going with Raphael. You're, 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 I'm sticking with Raphael. Yep. Right. Not doing it. Sorry. Any, any reason? Or I. I mean, I, I. I don't know him like that. You know, like we're not cool like that. I, like he wouldn't call me by whatever my nickname might happen to be, and I don't know that I have one. But if I did, I wouldn't expect him to call me that. So. What? What about uh, basketball? I mean, did you did did you go Carlton for a while? I mean, I I thought we all decided on Bub early. On. I dove into Bub, but I mean, Bub <laughs> is like, I mean, that's like that was his dad's nickname. That's his nickname. I mean, like, I I went for that. Like, he's Bub. That's his name, Bub. You know what I mean? But like, Poppy, my neighbor's dog is named Poppy. You know, like I like. That, and that's her formal name is Poppy. So I'll call her Poppy. But Raphael Williams is Raphael Williams for right. for me. And, and when I, and I'll write it and I'll, I'll quote people, if people are quoted, I'll, I'll, I'll write their quote as they say it. I'll write Poppy with an I, um, but <laughs> I'm going to keep, they put it, did you see, they put it on their official website. It's uh, on the pit rosters, Raphael Poppy Williams. Let me see if they did it on um, the, uh, the roster they hand out. What number is he wear? 20? No, they didn't. They put Raphael Williams jr. But I think on the website, it's Raphael Poppy Williams. So anyway, what were you saying about that? I apologize for uh, the digression. No, I mean, I, I like I, I believe the three returning receivers are going to be those main guys, but I think there's like a space for these guys. I think with just the way they rotate and how much tempo there's going to be, there's going to be snaps for all of them. And I, I mean, I, I think they can help. I, I just not expecting any of them to be the leading rusher or receiver this year. Yeah. I agree. And, and maybe that's maybe that's the best way. You know what I mean? You sprinkle them in, you mix them in, you use their speed where you can um, find different things you can do with them. Try not to be too predictable when they go on the field, but um, make the most of the, the talents that they've got. Josh Newark says two weeks out, predict the Ed Conway award winners and tell me Daniel Carter doesn't win it again. Uh, I mean, I'm not going to bet against Daniel Carter. Everybody knows that you don't bet against Daniel Carter for the Ed Conway award, but I haven't heard much about Daniel Carter, so I'm not going to go with him. I, I defense, I, I I don't think they typically like to give it to younger guys, but I mean, Chris Brooken seems like an obvious option. Either him or Jesse Anderson, they're t- or Braylon Lovelace, one of those guys from that 2023 recruiting class. They're talking them up so much. I think it's got to be one of them. Um, I don't know on offense. I'm going to keep thinking here. If you have a different option on defense, uh, let me hear it. And if you have a good option on offense, Jim, tell me because I I don't know who really. I, mean, I have a couple ideas on offense. What, what do you think? I mean, I guess kind of what what they decide what constitutes the Conway Award. I mean, I think they could go a couple different directions. Like, offensively, like, I, I think of someone like Jake Renda. Like, he hasn't played a lot. I think he's getting some good buzz. I think he has very well could be the number two tight end and he's going to see some time this year. So it wouldn't surprise me if, like, all right, like, we can tell you made a big jump and that might be it. I mean, it makes it different when the whole offensive staff is new. So, like, they have no, like – preconceived notions of who these guys were a year ago. I mean, they're, they're getting them fresh, but yeah, so who, how do they even, how do they even know who's most improved then? I guess, like how I guess, would Cade Bell and Jeremy Darvo and Bernowski and Laster and, and Lamar, how would these guys vote on most improved? They don't know improve from what? Right. I, I mean, or does it, does it start like the first day of camp till the spring game? Uh, Can who, you, who improved most during camp? Not like, you know, not who improved the most since last season, but who improved the most during camp. Yeah, maybe. So then it could be anybody. Mm-hmm. You know, it could be it could be Nate Yarnell. You know, like they, they could go that kind of route, vote of confidence, that kind of thing. The old uh, please don't transfer, we made you the Ed Conway <laughs> Award winner. Um, why would you need to do that to the starting quarterback? I don't know. Uh, like a Montrevious Lloyd or somebody like – 
I don't know. I don't know if there's an obvious option on on offense. I really don't. Did you say a defensive idea? Did, did I? No, I'm, I'm with you. I'm with you on uh, Brookins and Brookings. Anderson. I, I I keep hearing like such great things about both of them. Like yeah. they have five safeties they could probably feel comfortable playing this season. Absolutely. I mean, that's going to hurt Donovan McMillan's draft status when he splits reps with a uh, redshirt freshman. You know, we're talking about him being the uh, pit draft pick next year, but he's going to be splitting reps with Chris Brookins. So not going to go all that great. Uh, Josh Newark wants to know, do you think Mark Whipple will use the green dot or is running to the sideline still faster and providing more secure communication? I don't know. Is Mark Whipple coaching? I was going to ask, like, where's he coaching? <laughs> all right. Uh, come on, Josh. You're on the uh, research desk here. Uh, I'll Google it though. Um, nope. Wikipedia just says he's an American football coach who was most recently served as the offensive coordinator at Nebraska in 2022. So I guess he's not coaching anywhere. So he won't be doing any of it, green dot or sidelines, unless he's playing or coaching in high school, in which case he'll just send the wide receiver out with the play each snap, right? Um, Stanky Bits says, how much control the offense will Cade Bell have? Pat Narduzzi wants to control the ball and sustain long drives and chew the clock. Bell seems like the total opposite. Points, points, points. Well, so here's the thing. And, and I think, Jim, you've said this. I, I think we've all said this. Like, you're right. That is what Pat Narduzzi has told us for nine years that he wants to do. He wants to control the ball. He wants to sustain, sustain drives. He wants to win time of possession. But he hired a guy who is very much not going to win you time of possession. He might win you games. But Pitt will not win the time of possession a single game this season, you know, and by design. You know, if they win the time of possession, it will be an accident. Because if they play the way they want to play, they will lose time of possession every week, just like Tennessee did, just like Central Florida did. Um, a lot of, you know, I think a lot of Brian Kelly teams, you know, particularly back when he was in Cincinnati, they were always losing time of possession because they were going fast. So that's the goal. So Panarduzzi went out and hired someone who plays that way, who believes in playing that way. And I think he's going to give him full control of the offense. I, I think as much as people want to believe that Narduzzi is controlling with the offense and, and micromanages the offense, I, I really believe he lets the coordinator do what he wants to do. Even when it drives him crazy, he lets the coordinator do what he wants to do. And he hired a guy who does something very specific and has done it very well. And I think he'll let him do what he wants to do. So I, they're, they're going to run Cade Bell's offense. It might not work. It might be a disaster. Or it might be great. I don't know. But they're going to run Cade Bell's offense. I don't think Narduzzi's going to try and get him to slow down because he hired him to do what he does. Yeah, I mean, I, he, he has never had, like, control of the offense. He has always just washed his – not washed his hands of it, but it's like, all right, like, you're in charge of the offense, offensive coordinator. Do whatever you want. And, I mean – it takes a lot for him to step into the offense. I think we can count on maybe two or three times. And it, it has happened wherever he, he kind of revealed, he's like, I'm sitting in on the offensive meetings. Like I think maybe last year with the quarterback change was one of them. Maybe a few years back they were struggling and he had to figure something out. That's it. I mean, that's in nine seasons. I think maybe he, he kind of meddled in the offense twice. So yeah. I, I'm excited. K, K Bell has full autonomy. Like it's, it's his show. Yeah, 2020 was that year where after they had the bye week, the disaster uh, against Notre Dame, and and he he kind of he put put a little fire under the offensive staff and was like, "You need to tell me everything that we're doing, why we're doing it, and so on and so forth." I, I mean, like, look, if anybody wants evidence of Pat Narduzzi's hands off approach to offense, just look at the fact that Phil Dracovic started five games last year. <laughs> I mean, like any yeah. any coach in his right mind would have demanded a change. Because there's no way that any coach in their right mind, other than one guy, looked at that and said, this is okay. There's only one guy who thought it was okay. And everybody else deferred to him. And you see what the result was. So, if it, like, anytime somebody says Narduzzi meddles in the offense too much, I'd be like, no. Because if he meddled, Phil Dracovic would have been benched at West Virginia at halftime, which is when he should have been benched. That, that's when that should have come to an end. We're, we're all in agreement on that one, right? That's when it should have ended? Yeah. Yeah, okay. It was it was the West Virginia game. We didn't Fair didn't much. need to see much more. No, no, didn't even need to see more after the first half. Uh, Football Hawk wants to know starters on the defensive line. Um, <clears throat> I, I would say Dayon Hayes and Nate Matlack at defensive yep. end. Do you agree about that? That would be my pick. I don't have a great read on tackle. Fitzsimmons and Donald, Sean Fitzsimmons and Elliot Donald. What do you think? 
Uh, I would say Fitzsimmons. I, I wouldn't be surprised if it's Nakai. I, I, I really well, think, yeah. I think he, he's really taken to that, and I, I think they're pretty excited about that. So I don't, I don't know when Elliot Donald's going to crack into the lineup and be the four-star recruit with the last name Donald, but it has to start happening soon, and you know it probably should have happened by now. Time, you know, with that kind of pedigree, and I don't just mean the name, but the ranking and everything that was sort of expected of him to not get it done, to not really have made any kind of an impact. It's a little concerning. Um, Ryan says, predict Brandon Johnson, Jalen Lowe, Ishmael Leggett, and Bub Carrington are on Pitt's 2024 roster. So Brandon Johnson is a transfer from Eastern Car- East Carolina, right? Yes. That's the guy that Houston just wrote about today. I, I'm getting them confused, all these guys. I, I like I like Brandon Johnson. I like how he fits, shoots threes. You know, I think he averaged more than two three two made three pointers per game last season, which is a pretty decent number, shooting 35% from out there, 45% from the field, averaged like 13 and eight or 14 and eight, something like that. Um, this past season in East Carolina. I, I think he's a really intriguing fit. Um and if they could get him. To go with, you know, if they could keep the three guards, bring in Brandon Cummings, bring back Zach Austin, have the twins, and bring this guy in, Brandon Johnson, to be the starting four, I think that's pretty good. I, I think that makes a pretty positive impact. What, what do you think of uh, what do you think of the chances of getting those four guys that he mentioned there, Johnson, Lowe, Leggett, and Carrington, and what do you think of Johnson as a potential fit for Pitt? I have a feeling we're going to be asked this question a lot until we get clarity on Bob Ish and Low. I mean, it's, it's just going to be like a recurring question. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, it, it's it still hasn't changed from last week. It hasn't changed from when we answered earlier in, in the show. I mean, I I think Bob. It, it comes down to the NBA. Jeff Capel said as much. He was on uh, ninety three seven of the fan the other day, and he's like, "Our competition for Bob isn't the transfer portal. It's the NBA." Yeah. And I, I think everyone knows that. I mean, I I I, I still feel pretty confident they're going to get Low and Ish back. I think they're going to get that work out and. It's so hard to predict transfer portal commitments because any other school can jump in at any other time. I mean, Brandon Johnson, I think he has two visits at Pitt and Miami. And I mean, I know historically through the years, I normally don't bet against Miami against kids they want to get. So yeah. we'll see. I mean, I, I don't I don't know. I mean, I think he's a good fit. I think he's exactly what they're looking for to kind of replace Henson. But it's never easy going up against uh Miami boosters. Yeah, right. Right. Just call it that. Well, we'll keep uh, getting these questions, but they'll <laughs> change the extra guy. So it'll be like, uh, what are the chances of having low legged Carrington and Brandon Johnson? Or what are the chances of having low legged Carrington and Malik Thomas? There, there'll always be like a different fourth guy mixed in there. Um, and, and so it's it's not the same question. It's a different question each time. We just give the same answer every time. <laughs> um Let's see. Ryan wants to know a uh, prediction. Does the spring portal help or hurt Pitt this year? Feels like we should know where we can add a good uh, DT or DB. Uh, hope nobody good leaves, though. So the, the problem with the spring portal this year for Pitt is they still need like six or seven guys to go just to fit everybody under the 85-man scholarship limit. Right. So people are talking about like what they need to add. It's not going to be about addition. They're going to have attrition. They're going to have to have attrition just to get down to the limit. So there was a point where I was like, uh, they could still you really use a, another corner, or they could use a this, or they could use a that. I don't see them having enough room to add anybody else. There'll be players available, but I mean, Jim, do you see them getting down to a spot where they're at only at 83 or 84 and they can bring in another transfer or two? No, I mean, I don't think. I mean, I, I, would they start 92 before spring camp? And I mean, are they, they were they able to, okay. I think they were 93 and then Nate Temple uh, okay. is medical. So I think that puts them at 92 right now. So they need seven, seven spots to open to get down to 85. I, I don't see it happening. Cause they have like seven recruits probably sitting at home, you know, that are expected to join the program in June. So, I mean, I, I think your DT uh, that you're hoping to add is just your Whittington who was, who's been around all week. I think he, he's, He's doing his spring break in Pittsburgh, which wouldn't be my pick, but um, yeah, not this week. <laughs> yeah, no, not this week. But yeah, I, I think the the guys you're going to add are the the recruiting class you have signed. I mean, I don't know if there's a lot of room for transfers at this point. Yeah, I agree. Um, 
scroll through here, find some people who haven't uh, uh, commented. Well, Lad Scrimpton says, uh, not to get off topic, but can you do a video covering the ACC drama, the conference realignment, and the future of the ACC and Pitt? Here's the problem with that. I, I don't know. Like, like, I just, I don't know. I mean, this stuff that Florida State and Clemson came up with, I think somebody else actually had a question about this. Like, this stuff they came up with of, like, I mean, it was reminiscent of, th there was that old joke about, like, Bill Clinton haggling over the definition of is. And, and like, that's what this feels like with Florida State and Clemson. They're like, no. See, what we meant was the grant of rights only applies to us as long as we're in the ACC. It's like, wait, what? Everybody and their brother has always taken that to mean it applies beyond the time you're in the conference. Like that, what's the point of signing this thing if it doesn't apply beyond, you know what I mean? If it's not yeah. meant to keep you in the con So like, it feels like they're grasping at straws. It feels like they're just trying to like throw a bunch of, you know, tobacco flavored poo at the wall and see what sticks. And I just... I don't know. And maybe one of it, one part of it will stick. Maybe eventually it'll get to a point where they'll find a judge somewhere who's like, all right, yeah, I'll go with that. Yeah, I'll say that. I think you're right. You can get out without paying. And then they'll go. But I don't know. And I don't know what the future holds for college football and college sports. I, I don't know. I Because there are endless conference realignment possibilities. There are en endless college football playoff expansion possibilities. There are endless NIL adjustment possibilities. There are endless collective bargaining possibilities that could come around the corner. I don't know what college football is going to look like three years from now, let alone five or 10 or 15. I, I, I just don't know. So I could do a video about all that stuff, but it's going to be like 20 minutes of everything I just said over the last 90 seconds with me just repeating it and occasionally saying like and subscribe. That's all I got. Yeah, I mean, we are like so many rungs below, like <laughs> what like anyone would know about this. Like, I think it was back like during like the Pac-12 drama in the summer. I, I think it was Utah's AD who said something. Like, he tweeted, he's "Like, we're happy where we are." And, like a week later, like the Pac-12 dissolved. I'm like, if the athletic director of the University of Utah didn't know what was going to happen in a week, we 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 sure as hell don't. <laughs> it, it really, and, and people think too. They're like, "Why isn't Heather like getting something done here?" I'm like she can be involved and she can try but like this happens at the you know school president chancellor conference commissioner level and above you know i mean it's it's security clearance like black and above <laughs> and and like you know there there are like things things will filter down and trickle out but for the most part i, I just, and i just don't know i mean like my biggest feeling about college sports right now is just uncertainty i just don't know what it's going to be i hardly even have any idea what the hell it is right now and i don't know what it's going to be in a couple of years because it's drastically different from what it was a few years ago and it certainly doesn't feel like it's in a place that it can stay right now so what are college sports going to look like in five years I, like i don't know and in a way that's kind of troubling because i think about some of the more like cynical outcomes some of the more uh, dystopian outcomes of what it could be um and those are all unpleasant because they involve me having ending up having to get a real job which i would rather <laughs> not do uh, but but at the same time like you know who knows maybe it could go a different way and it could end up you know it's part of the you know got it got a seat at the big table and all that i i, I just don't know you know i i have no idea where this is gonna go and I mean, it just everything changed right after I think Pitt won the ACC championship. <laughs> they broke it. They <laughs> broke it. The entire sport changed because Pitt won a championship. I mean, it, it's yep. ridiculous. They broke. They broke the ACC. They broke the divisions. They broke the whole. Th like the world could not survive with Pitt <laughs> having that level of success. You know, it, it, it was. It, it was. It was the only way. So you're right. That was, that was, yeah, that was the, uh, nothing's been the same ever since. that was, that was the, uh, you know, patient zero was that, you know, Kenny Pickett holding that uh, trophy, the fake slide and everything like that. 
Like the crazy, the first crazy transfer portal thing was Jordan Addison. Like, of course it had to be. Right. It, it had to be Pitt's best player to like break this whole thing open. That's true. Yeah, the one that really got people like, holy cow, that could happen? That's that's right. Because, well, I guess Caleb Williams had transferred, right? From Ohio, from Oklahoma to USC? Yeah, but that was like still like, because his coach was because there. his coach, right. Like, it, it wasn't, like, an active All-American at one school, like, just... A Letnikoff award winner <laughs> yeah. who had just had success. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Wow. I never really thought about this. Pitt as the uh, the, the, the the moment. Pitt, <laughs> Pitt winning a championship is the moment when it all... Uh, uh, this is going to keep me up for a while tonight, Jim, thinking about the implications of this. But uh, we'll, we'll, we'll let it go here before everybody gets uh, too depressed. But um, we thank everybody for tuning in tonight, as always, of course. So make sure you like this video and subscribe, youtube.com slash pantherlair.com. And check out the website, panther-lair.com, pittsburgh.rivals.com for all the pit sports coverage, pit practice tomorrow, spring camp. They're back at it in the south side. I'll be down there. We'll have lots of coverage from that. Jim's got a lot of coverage coming from Pro Day and recruiting and all the different things that we cover at pantherlair.com. So make sure you tune in. Panther-lair.com, pittsburgh.rivals.com. The Jim, thanks for your time tonight. Thanks, everybody, in the comments and the chats. You guys have a good evening, and we will talk to you tomorrow for the Morning Pit right here on youtube.com slash pantherlair.com.